My name is Ramu Nagapan. I'm the director of the Humanities and Education Department at UC Berkeley Extension. Um, and we're delighted to sponsor events like this. Um, these kinds of lectures have become a reliable tradition at Extension. Um, it's a way for us to showcase uh, the talents and incredible expertise of the people who teach in our programs. Um, and this particular uh, lecture kind of coincides with the launch of a new set of uh, career advising services that we're going to offer at Extension. We'll have more um, information about that on our website in the coming months, so check that out. We have our catalogs in the back as usual. Our summer term is just getting underway and it's a great time to delve into a new class, so I encourage you to peruse the catalog. Um, so a couple of technical notes. Um, we are filming the event. You probably saw the camera in the back. So if you um, ask questions later during the Q&A, just be advised that your image and voice will probably appear on film. Um, and then after Q&A, um, I believe Dr. Uh, Nemka will be signing books um, outside. So that's another chance for you um, to check out his material and talk to him some more. So we are in, uh, incredibly fortunate to have uh, Dr. Marty Nemko here today. Um, he's in his uh, 24th year as the host of a radio program, Work with uh, Marty Nemko. He's the author of many books, um, uh, including How to Do Life, What They Didn't Teach You in School. Um, as you probably know, he's appeared many times in print and in various media, um, and he is definitely acknowledged as one of the um, foremost experts uh, in this area of, of uh, career coaching. So please uh, join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Marty Nemko. Thank you very much. I will do my best not to suck. <laughs> you know, having done this career counseling thing for 26 years, you change over time. And certain things that you believe are true, you start to wonder whether they're really that true. I'm going to talk about eight of those today. And the first one could be described, it would be if there was a Bay Area motto, it would be follow your passion. Do what you love and the money will follow. Or do what you love and the money will follow. And if not, your parents or somebody else will take care of you. And I used to believe that. I used to tell my clients all the time, do what you love. Life's short. But things have changed. 4,000 clients have made me change. Right now in the Bay Area, there probably are hundreds, if not thousands, of people whose passion is the environment. And they are managers and directors and vice presidents of, of, of solar companies and wind companies, or they're activists, they're lobbyists for nonprofits. They are following their passion, and it's working. They did what they love, the money will follow, did follow. <sighs> but there are a whole lot of people who have done what they loved, and poverty followed. Maybe the most vivid example of this is one of my first clients, probably way back in 85, 86. She was bright. She was well-educated. She was focused. She had a nice personality. And she was a committed, committed environmentalist. She was always in the vanguard. She was the first to want to get lead paints, lead out of paints, so that African-American kids in the inner city didn't you know, chip the paint and eat it. She was the first in the 80s to build straw bale houses, you know, houses built out of bales of straw. Like a number of my clients, she's kept in touch with me over the years. She's now in her 60s. She's never made more than $10 an hour. She's living in welfare housing. She has high blood pressure. And she's terrified of being homeless. She asks, what the hell was this about do what you love and the money will follow? So this is the first example of many that I'm going to give today that's going to call for nuance. We tend to believe in bumper sticker rhetoric. This is good, this is bad. We long for simple truths in an ever more complicated society. But when you hear I don't know, shibboleth is too strong. When you hear mantras like do what you love and the money will follow, follow your passion, I think it's very wise to think. It's not so clear, not so simple. Now, 
What's the alternative? Of course, you can do what you love as a hobby, but one of the things that's been most helpful to my clients is to find something that maybe is not the thing you're most passionate about, because most people, especially here in the Bay Area, are passionate about just a small number of things. Entertainment, sports, the environment, yoga, get rid of the Republican Party. <laughs> but the problem is we are in a capitalist society, and supply and demand means that there are, for every time there is a job, you know, working in television, there are nine zillion applicants. And so that's why they end up paying crap, because they don't have to pay a lot. They know there's 9,000 people in the wings. And when they hire you, they don't have to treat you well either, because let's say you're working for the environment. I want you to work 12 hours a day. After all, you believe in the cause, don't you? So they pay you nothing, or $32,000, a year for the 12 hours a day, and treat you like crap. And so ironically, many people who are following their dream, following their passion, end up being unhappy because they're not treated well. They're not, they don't have stable employment. So what I've been telling my clients over the, increasingly over the last decade, but acceleratingly now, is to look for something, yes, that you are interested in, but that has a higher probability of resulting in meaningfully good employment. Because what makes people happy, ultimately, is a good boss ethical work, reasonable pay, reasonable commute, good co-workers, those things. And it's easier to find a job and job stability, job security, so you're not running around looking for a job every week. You're more likely to find those in an under the radar career. That's one of my favorite terms, under the radar. And I'm going to give you example after example after example after example right now of under the radar careers. First one that comes to mind, I have a client who's an Egyptologist. Well, yes, you know, a lot of people are interested in information in, in international affairs, but narrowly focusing on something under the radar like that that does have some commercial viability. Unfortunately, for better or for worse, there, it, there is nobody who says that the problem is going to go away in the Middle East. But being a Middle East specialist is way too broad. So she picked something under the radar. I have another client. I, I spent a lot of time in Napa, and so I know I have a, know a lot of people in the wine industry. But there's a million people who want to be winemakers. But I have a client who, for some reason, she's not passionate about it, but she really likes nice wine glasses. So she sells these beautiful wine glasses. She brought one into a session wrapped. It was very delicately wrapped. The most beautiful wine glass I ever saw. And because people don't aspire, very few people aspire to be the wine glass queen, She's making a darn good living. And let me tell you, the margins on those high-end wine glasses, you should know from it. It's really <laughs> I don't think cocaine has that high a profit margin. <laughs> but I digress. OK, more examples. All right, let's see. We have, uh, oh yeah, Guy uh, was very frustrated with the, the care that his mother had gotten in an elder care facility. So while it, certainly he's a young guy, he doesn't have any real passion about elders. You know, it's, it's not, you know, elders smell. Elders are, you know, it's, there's issues when, when people get in the end stages of life. But he cared enough about it that he was going to make that his career. And he's now a marketer for a very high quality assisted living facility. That's not, there aren't 10,000 people applying for that job. More examples. Of course, everybody knows healthcare, 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 because we boomers are getting older. But there are some under the radar, even in the healthcare field. Optometrist is one of my very favorites. You cure almost every patient. UC Berkeley happens to have one of the world's leading optometry programs. And you get to be a doctor of optometry, but it only takes four years out of high school, four years out of college, excuse me. Or there's combined programs that are six year programs, bachelor, or seven year programs, bachelor's, and uh, uh, OD, Doctor of Optometry. Not here, but I think at UC, at, uh, UC Riverside. But in any case, you succeed with nearly every patient. You don't get middle of the night calls, my glass prescription changed. <laughs> you know? So six figure salary, prestige, high success rate, under the radar. There aren't 10 zillion people. Everyone, I want to be a doctor, or I want to be a nurse. But there aren't a zillion people saying, I want to be an optometrist. Right? One example. Orthodontist. 
A lot of people say dentist. But the real reward, the most rewarding specialty that's, again, under the radar is orthodonture. Because, first of all, the money is unbelievable. They make over 300000 a year, typically. They succeed, again, with every patient. And what's beautiful is they develop a long-term relationship with their patients. Because you've got to see them every week, every month, whatever, for six months, a year, whatever. So it becomes, it's like a hairdresser. Hairdressers love their careers. Studies show that hairdressers have the highest job satisfaction. Because they're seeing people for 10 or 15 minutes every three to six weeks. They develop a relationship with them. They succeed with nearly every client, unless they give you a screwy up, hair, screwed up haircut. <laughs> of course, with my hair, there's nothing they could do. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I digress again. OK. So um, orthodontist, great career. Many people in the Bay Area love government work. The, my favorite under the radar job title in government work is program analyst. It is a very common job description in the federal government. And believe me, the federal government has, don't think you got to move to Washington, D.C. to work for federal government. We have two enormous buildings in downtown Oakland. We've got a big one here in San Francisco. Federal government is the largest employer in America and has a major presence here. Right? Program analyst is the coolest job in the world. I think you can get hired with a bachelor's, maybe a master's, depends. And you are somebody who analyzes various social programs, AIDS prevention programs, Native American and other programs, every kind of government program. They need you to analyze you know, what's, you know, what, what kind of program should they use, how should it be evaluated. Very cool career does not require a PhD. Under the radar. Who knows about being, how many of you had heard of program analysts before we started? You're kidding? Yeah, you had heard of program analysts? I'm impressed. What an audience. I'm, I'm cowed. <laughs> Maybe you should come up here. I should sit in the audience. OK. Um, OK. Also, this one is certainly well known. But many people think about being an architect. But one of the most rewarding niches within that is landscape architecture. Yeah. It's a great career, very high satisfaction. But these are examples of things that many people would be interested in. I'm not asking you to be a ditch digger. These are things that are, you could be interested in, maybe even go to be passionate about as you got to be the go-to girl or go-to guy in it. But it's not like being an environmentalist or wanting to be on TV, being the next Oprah. So one of the ways you deal with the fact that follow your passion is not necessarily going to be the magic answer is to find something under the radar. But let's say you really do want to follow your passion that is a long shot passion. You want to be an actor. You want to be a poet. You want to be whatever. Some of my clients say that. I'm not going to disabuse them. What I do, though, is to control their risk. I tell them, circle a date on your calendar. It could be three months from now, six months from now, two years from now. And give it your all. Be, there's another phrase I love, laser focused in achieving your goal. If by that time, by the date that comes, with, comes around, the world is giving you signs that, OK, maybe a living is going to happen here, great. You have done what you love, and the money will follow. But if by that date you circle on the calendar, the world is not giving you signs that you're going to be making a living at this, then you, have to, you can feel good about abandoning the plan. You can look yourself and your family in the eye and say, I did not give up without trying. I gave it a great shot. And you'll feel better about going to a less risky plan B. Make sense? I feel I have to make one mention of it. Being an actor, I, I spend a lot of time in the world of theater. Uh, my wife's a good actress. I, but I've directed plays and stuff. I have found, in general, that professional actors are miserable. Because unless you're a true you know, Tony Award winning star, you are likely to be spending most of your time waiting. Waiting for the audition to come. Waiting if you get cast, you're probably going to get a small role. And you're, you're flying to New York, and you're waiting for the, for the callbacks. And they're, they're terribly insecure. And as I said, they only usually get to small parts. So when you're in a small part in a play, you still have to show up for all the, most of the rehearsals, and you're waiting most of the time in rehearsal. And then during the play, you're waiting backstage most of the time. It ain't fun. I know a woman. I, I was tempted to mention her name, but I didn't get her permission in advance, so I'm not going to. But she went to Broadway. She tried, really tried. 
and nothing. She was in the chorus a little bit, you know. <laughs> and that's it. So she gave up, she came back to the Bay Area. And she um, got a day job. She actually works in, I'll just say, in the wine industry. A uh, day job, so she's not eating cat food. She's, she's, got a, she's got a day job. But while she was an utter failure at Broadway, she is fabulous for the North Bay. She gets starring role after starring role after starring role all the time. People beg her, they precast her. She doesn't have to audition. She gets precast. And she loves her life now because she's making a middle class living. She's the star. You know, whether the, the audience is on Broadway or in the North Bay, you, you don't even notice it. She's still in these very high level productions. And so very often, one of the ways to do your passion is, of course, to do it as a hobby. And you can take it very seriously. I mean, I do play the piano very, very, I used to do it for a living when I was a kid. I played over 2,000 weddings and bar mitzvahs before I was 22. And I still play the piano very seriously. And I played at the Napa Valley Opera House for an hour before Funny Girl opened. But I don't rely on it for my living. Doing what you love seriously as a hobby is, I take it as seriously as I'm taking this. I try to be world class every time I sit at that piano. I try to be amazing, as, as amazing as I can be. And that drive to be excellent feels great, whether I'm getting paid or not. Okay, so that's the first of the career so-called truths that I used to be a true believer in that I'm now feeling a little more nuanced about. The second one, uh, I'm going to take questions at the end. The second of the career so-called truths is that the key to landing jobs and career success in general is three things. Network, network, and network. And indeed, when I was getting trained to be a career counselor, they would say, network, network, network. I dutifully followed the instructions and told my clients to network, network, network. And some of them, it worked out fabulously. They've gotten all their jobs through networking. They either love schmoozing or they become LinkedIn ninjas, and they just know exactly what to do to get people to answer their email and all that stuff. But a lot of other people put in all that time and effort, and they have to screw up the courage to go to that meet and greet. And they walk home with their tail between their legs, because just some people don't have the gift of instantly connecting. There's some people who light up a room. There are some people who turn down the lights in a room. And they just don't know what to say. They don't have the right feel. It's, it's like playing the piano. I am a natural pianist. I could do it. I never took, never practiced. I could just do it by ear. I could play anything. Some that, it's that way with networking. And I'm not bragging about myself because I'm terrible. I can't fix a thing. I'm horrible on a team. You don't want me on a team. But I can play the piano. And some people can network, really network. And some people are not only finding it a waste of time, but it hurts them. Networking actually hurts them. And I'm one of them. While I feel very comfortable here, I love speaking to an audience, and I love writing. But at parties or at get-togethers, I I'm too intense. I simply am. I, I think I was born with a big adrenal gland. <laughs> so I'm too intense. I tend to interrupt. I'm a, I come off as a know-it-all. And so people hate me. I'm worse off networking than if I didn't network at all. Right? So my question to you, and I invite you to think about, is think of yourself as a horse, a racehorse. Your likelihood of winning the next race is somewhat predicted by how well you did the last 20. So think of all your previous efforts to network, to go to meet and greets, to use the internet, to schmooze in various ways. To what extent has that been fruitful to you in either getting meaningful job leads or when you're on the job, getting inside information, getting skills, getting mentoring? Ask yourself for all the time that you have put in to networking, has that been a cost-effective use of your time? Again, one size does not fit all. 
That's the message. It's nuance. Instead of network, 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 it's a nuance message. For you, is there a better use of that discretionary time? Should you, instead of networking, should you be spending more time building your skills, writing an article, doing your work, whatever it is, spending time with your family? Just a question, oh, again, an attempt to get some a little nuance to this. The third of the eight career so-called truths that I'm not so sure are true anymore is another component of landing a job. And the, it is that to land a job, you need to sell yourself. Now, what could seem more obvious? Of course, you need to sell yourself. I mean, it's the American way, market, 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 sell, sell, sell. We live in a land of hype. Sell, of course you sell it, especially when you're looking for a job, they're expecting you to sell. And indeed, we were trained that when I got my career counseling training. They taught you, you know, everything, like even uh, how to go about, oh, even writing their resumes for them, writing their cover letters, writing, you know, teaching them, you know, a 15 second elevator pitch. How do you hide the gaps in your employment? You know, how do you hide your age? You know, we're going to sell, you know, it's all about putting shine on the package, on the shoe. It's not about improving the shoe, it's about shining it. And after a while, I felt oily. I started, as I got older, into my 40s, I started to think, to forgive the high sounding word, the, uh, cosmically. I wasn't just thinking as an advocate for my client, I was thinking about the impact of what I was doing on everybody. You know, lawyers, they just think about how can I defend my client. Instead of just helping my client, you know, I'm a very goal-oriented guy, so I was going to, you know, I was always, I'm going to do whatever I can to get this client a job. But then I started to think, if I help a candidate get a job when he or she is unlikely to be the best candidate for that job, thereby depriving a more qualified candidate for the job, aren't I being and essentially making the world worse? I went into career counseling to make the world better. And I'm helping a less qualified person get the job? And what is the implications of that? Certainly, especially if the other job applicant is, doesn't have the money to pay me, then I'm merely exacerbating the gap between rich and poor for no good, on no merit-based reason. And what about the employer? If I'm successful at what I'm doing, I'm getting this less qualified person hired, saddling that employer with a less good employee. And the coworkers who that person would be working with. In the end, it is a zero-sum game. Not everybody gets employed. And if I'm helping less qualified people get employed, am I hurting the more qualified candidate, the employer, the coworkers, and ultimately, since everybody gets employed to create better products and services, am I not hurting the, indirectly, in the, some small way, hurting the quality of products and services that get dispensed? So I now, um, I spend very little time trying to help people land a job unless I'm really a good champion of them, and I still will never write their resumes for them. Because remember, there's a whole career, a whole industry has been spawned of resume writers. But really, they are no more ethical than having, hiring somebody to write your college application essay. Because the resume is not just a recitation of one's work history. A resume is used by employers as a way to measure the ability for someone to think clearly and organize their thoughts. It is used as a, a measure of seeing how well they write as w a, an index of how error-free a document they can produce. If I am writing or even heavily editing that resume, I am really being deceptive in an important way. So you might say, how do I stay in business? I'm a career counselor. Because, and I will admit that many prospective clients don't buy this. And by the way, I turn down a number of clients when I feel like these are people I just can't champion. I just turn them down. I do it all the time. But if it's somebody I feel I can champion, I still tell them that your goal is not to sell yourself. So that's the wrong metaphor, selling. The right metaphor, matchmaking. 
I, I mentioned I'm a terrible team player. If I were looking to be employed, in addition to outlining my strengths, I would mention in my initial cover letter that I'm a terrible team player. I tend to dominate teams, act like a know-it-all, get very frustrated or shut up, and in which case I'm very unhappy when I have to shut up. And so if you're looking for somebody who is going to be a strong individual contributor who can do a lot of very difficult projects by himself, no problem. I'm good. You need a team player, hire somebody else. That enables the right employer to say, yes, this is who we want. And the wrong employer will reject me immediately. And that is right for me, so that I'm going to be successful in the job I get. And it's right for the employer and the coworkers and society. So that is what I try to teach them, and I'm trying to teach you. Again, you may think I'm being too high-minded here, but I'm here to share my truth. So instead of the, sh the, the, tr the so-called truth that job seekers should sell themselves, I invite you to practice radical honesty, to think of the metaphor as not selling, but matchmaking. OK. Next truth. If anybody should be an advocate for self-employment, you would think it would be me. And these days, when employers do pay people as little as they can get away with, they hire you a part-time temp, no benefits, they offshore as much as they can, they automate, do more with less, all that stuff, self-employment is very tempting to many people. The phrase is, people will use is, screw the man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take charge of my own life. And in addition to feeling that way, my father, who was a Holocaust survivor, for him, his healing and his way of moving my mom and my sister and me out of the tenement in the Bronx where I was living was self-employment. He was working sewing shirts in a factory in Harlem. But eventually, he became self-employed, ran a crappy little store in Brooklyn. And it was enough that we ended up, I grew up after the first six years in the bottom half of a duplex in Flushing, Queens. Um, but self-employment did it for him. And so I was predisposed to self-employment. But now, 4,000 clients 26 years later, I'm daunted. Yes, I am successfully self-employed. But it has not been easy. And I've helped many of my clients try to be self, successfully self-employed. And some of them have absolutely succeeded. But many haven't. And I've come to realize it's much more difficult to be self-employed than I originally thought. You not only have to be very good at what you do, but you have to be willing and able to market. And very often, that what makes the, the things that make you good at what you do, whether it be a counselor or an artist or a whatever, is antithetical. It's, it's not the, the same kind of personality. It doesn't, um, doesn't fit for marketing. They don't want to do it, and so they fail. And when you're running a small business, a one-person business, a two-person business, three-person business, you are, there is no IT department. You are the IT department. There is no HR department. You are the HR department. There is no accounting department. You are the accounting department. So what a hell of a difficult skill set that is. You've got to be great at what you're doing, better than what the corporations will offer. And you've got to be a marketer who's does, willing to do it and good at it. You've got to do, fix your own computers, usually. Because if you pay, if you go and outsource and you pay for accounting, you pay for health, for, for HR, and you pay for um, uh, computer stuff, that's, especially if you're paying for individual health care policies, there's going to be no money left for, for any kind of decent profit. So, I'm not saying self-employment is bad. I'm just saying this notion that we tend to today, too, I think we too quickly leap to that as a desirable alternative for folks who are not so easily getting a job. So let's talk, though, about I'm always trying to balance the positive with the negative. There certainly are some kinds of self-employment that I am relatively bullish on. Because I think the market is there, it's a relatively simple business, and doesn't require a lot of money to start. The first I want to share because it's such a, it's just a kind of an, an innovative idea. I don't like norm I don't normally like cutting edge ideas because the leading edge too often turns out to be the bleeding edge. Guinea pigs often get sacrificed, so I don't want you to be a guinea pig. But here is an idea. I just think it's so cool, so I have to mention it. Corporations 
occasionally go to business school professors and say, would you like, we, could, we have a problem, and Google has just done this. They went to Haas Business School, went to a professor, uh, no, Stanford, sorry, a Stanford Business School professor and said, we are looking for um, a new brand. We want to use a different name, a Google.biz name or Google dot some, some extension. Would your class want to take on a project of coming up with cool new extensions for Google? The business professor loved it because it gives a class a real world project rather than typical term projects or whatever, the kind of the results of it go into the ether, it does nobody any good. The corporation was thrilled, they got cheap labor and, and Google offered like, I think, $1,000 to the winning, winning proposal. But he, for that little that thousand dollars, there were twenty Stanford business students working at it. So the, cor the corporation, Google, was thrilled. The professor was thrilled, and the kids were thrilled. The students were thrilled. So it made me think that was a win-win-win. What about a small business which requires no money to start, where you broker these things? You go to corporations, say, "How would you like classes?" to go and do your special projects for you. And then you run to Stanford and Berkeley or whatever and get a professor who would say, that'd be a cool class project. You bring them together and you get a fee from Google or from, you know, from the company. Costs no money to start. There's so much profit th that the company makes out of this that I think somebody could make a good living doing that and everybody wins, right? That, I like that idea. Anyway, but as I said, the cutting edge too often turns out to be the bleeding edge here are some less risky, more tried and true, but I still think smart self-employment opportunities that don't require much investment, um, but have a, a potential for real profit. The first is totally obvious, it's tutor. Parents, many parents, even not rich parents, blue collar parents, are terrified of their kids falling behind. They feel the public schools today, for reasons that go beyond what I can talk about here, primarily focused on the very lowest achievers. And if your kid is not a, the lowest achiever but not doing real well, the public schools will very often ignore your child. And so parents, their kids are everything to them. They will pay $100 an hour or more for a good tutor. And that's especially true if your kid's got learning disabilities, is on the autism spectrum, et cetera. It requires no money. It doesn't even have to have their nice office. You can come to people's houses and you can be a tutor if you're, I mean, not everybody can be a tutor, but I think for the right person, tutoring can be a very lucrative and low-cost self-employment. Another example. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Many, many people now, ever more than ever, especially if you're busy, feel that the way you're going to meet your romantic partner is online. You know, whether it be IQCupid or Match.com or Christian Singles or JDate, there's a lot of online stuff going on. And it's really hard to really get clear about what you want, who you are, what's the right picture that, that accurately really represents the real you. And so I think that there, there are some of these people already, but I think there is a, a real unmet need for relationship ad coaches helping people create their relationship. And again, you see how ethically pure, there's no ethical compromises here. You're, it's clearly pro-social, doesn't require money to start. I think it's a great career for the right person. I actually, as part of the work I do with my clients, I, I have a camera, I take, pic, I take pictures of my, we, we work on relationship ads as part of what I, as a career and life coach, we, we absolutely do that. I love it, it's fun and they love it. Okay, um, okay. What, you know, I'm being very white collar here, but some of you may be good with your hands, unlike me. And I've thought of, and again, this is a new idea, but I, I really love it. I call it the space maker. Somebody who, you know, many homeowners have a garage that's filled with crap, a basement that's filled with crap, an attic that's filled with crap, and it just, oh, you know, nobody wants to even think about it, it's just there. But imagine a business in which you first cleaned out their basement garage or whatever, and then installed cabinets and shelves so it became this wonderful new usable space. You don't need to be a master carpenter to do this, but it seems like that's a nice low-hanging fruit because you're taking, you're creating a couple of hundred square feet of usable space. And with real estate being worth $200 a square foot, that's $40,000 of added space in a 200 square, 200 square foot house. 
So you can make a pr pretty good case that, hey, I'm going to give you 200 square feet of usable space for very little, for a couple of grand, for five, four grand instead of 40. Just a thought. And let's see. And one more. This is really now really declassé, but I like it. I like cart businesses because you don't have to pay rent. Now, coffee carts, I've been touting them for 20, 20 years now. They're, they're ubiquitous. There's too many coffee carts, espresso carts. I started to help somebody start one called um, Liquid Assets. And she opened Liquid Assets right near the Schwab building. Liquid Assets, Schwab, Schwab, OK. Anyway, um, uh, I still think that carts are great because there's no rent. And I really like them, especially in the lobbies of office buildings. I, I swear they must have gotten this idea for me in, this, in the Oakland Court building, where I had to pay a speeding ticket. I come into the uh, 7th in Washington or whatever, and in the corner there, there is this kind of little, this cart, kind of a, looks like a little mini caboose or something. And there's a long line. They're selling sandwiches, and they're selling desserts, and coffees, and burritos. The guy's making money hand over fist. He doesn't have to pay rent. He pays zero rent, because it's just lobby space. And yet he's got this huge captive audience. So whether it be hospital lobbies, because the food's crappy in hospitals, or office building lobbies, you go to the owner of some big office building and you say, how would you like to make thing, like, li life much easier for you, all your tenants, and it won't cost you a dime? I'd like to set up a you know, burrito cart, or whatever it is, in the corner of your lobby. No rent. So cart businesses. OK, let me see what we're doing. I'm going to check the, which clock is right. OK, we're good. OK. So, with regard to self-employment, you see I'm trying to be, instead of, it's a great idea, it's a poor idea, I wanting to be more nuanced and I want you to be more nuanced. It's right for some people, wrong for others, and certainly you want to control your risk desperately. I've proposed approaches to self-employment that do control your costs so that if you make the inevitable screw up, you ha you're not broke, okay? Okay, next. And I, I need to acknowledge that I don't, I'm not going to be able to get through all eight. Um, but I figured better not to rush and do, do five or six right than rush through. Uh, but what the good news is, whenever I do an important presentation, and I was, you know, I was f actually flattered to be asked to do this. I, I think this is important. And uh, so I heard the person who uh, is the curator of TED Talks, the person who makes all the final selections for TED Talks. And he says he asked every TED presenter to actually script what they're going to say in advance. Not because they're going to use it. You notice I'm obviously not scripted at all. But it clarifies their thinking. So I, have, I did script this. I, I have an 11-page single-spaced document. And I thought rather than it going into the ether in a waste, it's free. It's there. I printed it out. It's right on the table next to where I'll be signing books. You may feel free to take one. I actually print out 100. So if you want to take more than one for somebody who hasn't come, you are welcome. So if we don't get through all eight, you will have that. It is really my careful, most careful, you know, it's one thing to speak off the cuff. It's my most carefully considered thoughts regarding each of these eight things. OK. So the next one of the widely believed career truths, especially here in the Bay Area, that it is more ethical and otherwise better to work for government or a nonprofit than for a company. There is a very significant anti-corporate bias here in the Bay Area from media and from the universities. Not extension, but if you do go to UC Berkeley classes, you will definitely get a not pro-corporate perspective. Um, and I, who's lived here in Berkeley for 40 years and have my degree, PhD and master's, and master's and PhD from Berkeley, certainly I could not have been more inculcated. And I read typical liberal you know, New York Times and whatever, and they all have those same biases. CNN, watch CNN. Um, but I've been given, I've had a couple of experiences that have given me serious pause. Remember I mentioned a little while ago about the two big office buildings in Oakland, the federal building? I'll spare you the details about why I was there, but I, I was there, and I walk up past the security guard, and I go to a, the floor where Health and Human Services is. And there is desk after desk after desk that are as clean as this. And every one of the people who was, work, who was working there 
was either literally polishing her nails or reading a magazine, desk after desk after desk after desk. Now they say we remember what's visual. That image is branded into my brain. These are, you know, working in the middle class people pay a very high percentage of their tax share in, in taxes. And that these people have the nerve to be literally polishing their nails. The second experience that kind of shook my faith in government was a caller to my radio show. And he called, you know, I do what I call three minute makeover, three minute career makeovers, three minute workovers. People call with their problem. The guy calls in and he says, I work for the city of San Francisco and I, uh, I work in, constru in construction, carpentry crew. And I keep trying to get my guys to work harder. They work really slow. They, what they do is, when I'm not there, he's kind of a supervisor, foreman person. When I'm not there, they will build a fence really, really slowly, and then they will knock it down and rebuild it again to look like they're busy, to show the higher-ups that they're busy and the public. They don't want to show that they're standing around. So they, they go in super slow motion. And when he tried to get him to work harder, they slid his tires. So that was the second experience that you know, instead of, you know, government is the higher good, wants to serve the people, it's not a profit motive, it kind of hurt a lot. It made me, again, I am not saying all government, there are some excellent government workers, there's no question. For example, I'm, I had to call 911, not a real emergency, a quasi-emergency, and I was grateful that that government service existed. And it was quick, they answered the phone, and, you know, I got, got exactly what I need. It was a light, it was a traffic light in Napa that was just stuck, it wouldn't change. So I called and they, they just got right on it and they said they'd send somebody out to change the lighting timing. It's great. So I'm not anti-government, but experiences like that, oh, I, one more I have to tell you, Jesus. A woman works for BART, a quasi-governmental agency. She had just gotten fired, but she, for nine years in a row, she, was, she said she was, used to get away with working, for, working one hour a day and paid $90,000 a year. She was proud how she was able to get away with it for nine years. So that, all that kind of stuff really kind of took some of the shine off of government work. And in, uh, most, you know, here in the Bay Area, because I work in Oakland, I have, you know, I'm on NPR, I get a very liberal audience. A lot of my clients are nonprofit workers. And again, some of them love their nonprofit work, they think it's great. But many more than a few have told me, so inefficient. Every decision is by consensus. It takes forever to get anything done. I feel guilty sometimes even asking people for money. You know, they're very often in development, in fundraising. They feel guilty asking for money because they know a lot of it does not get to the people who need it in any kind of efficient way. So again, I'm not anti-nonprofit, but I'm more nuanced about it. And then I had an epiphany about three years ago. And I started to think about these, quote, evil corporations. And I thought about my Prius, that miracle car that gets 45 miles a gallon, clean air, and completely reliable. Mine has 216,000 miles on it now. I've had to replace nothing, just oil and oil, one water pump, that's it. Fantastic car. Is Toyota evil? Multiply my Toyota by the millions of people who have these wonderfully reliable cars. Can we really say that Toyota is more evil than a nonprofit or government agency? But where did the impetus for Prius Association come from? Where did the impetus? I mean, right. why do we need government, right? For order. Well, anyway, um, that's a complicated question. I think about, for example, um, I take a baby aspirin every day as a way to not have a heart attack. Intense guys like me. You know, I'm very healthy right now, but you know, just prevention. That bear is located here in Berkeley. They have a big operation in Berkeley. For pennies a dose, I get that aspirin that could save my life. My refrigerator. I have a Whirlpool refrigerator. I bought it 15 years ago for $900. My food stays cold, reliably. I've never had to repair it for $900. Other examples. Even that corporate food, there's tremendous anti-corporate food movement here in the Bay Area. I can walk into Trader Joe's or any other company, food supermarket, Safeway, 
And for $1.99 a pound, I can get tomatoes on the vine, those nice, you know, they come on a little vine. I go to the farmer's market. I live right near the Rockridge Farmer's Market. I went once to the Rockridge Farmer's Market. They wanted $2.50 for a tomato, one tomato. Now, I can afford it if I felt it was worth it, no problem. But if it weren't for, quote, corporate tomatoes, the poor can't afford $2.50 a tomato. Are these corporations, is Toyota and Whirlpool and, 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 and the companies that make, quote, corporate food, are they really much worse than government agencies and nonprofits? Again, this is, not, this is a call for nuance. The point is, when you decide where to work, rather than as so often the message is given in many Bay Area media outlets and in the colleges, corporations are evil, I'm merely asking for nuance. I'm asking you to make judgments on a case-by-case -case basis in terms of what's right for you. I'm seeing one person, I'm not going to mention her, who's making all kinds of faces. Clearly, she is not going to want to work for a corporation. That's fine. I'm not asking everybody to work for, I'm just, the message here is about nuance, about instead of groupthink, individually making choices that are based on thinking in fuller dimension than we often do, that go well beyond the bumper sticker rhetoric. And because of time, what I want to do now is um, I'm just going to state without going into any detail. But the other three uh, are that the thing, the other three career truths that I have questions about, again, a nuance, we genuflect before the idea of work-life balance and that you, we, everybody should strive for work-life balance. And yet some of the most successful, rewarded people, are people who feel best about their lives and their work lives, are people whose lives are utterly out of balance. They work long hours. The cardiologist who sees patients evenings and weekends, or the oncologist who's really great, who wants to see people so they don't have to wait or see an inferior one. Rather than labeling them with a disease like alcoholic, which is like addiction to something bad, I think that people like that should be more honored as hard workers or even heroes. Or a relationship therapist who works nights and weekends because she's really good and really wants to help more people. Would should we pathologize her as a workaholic? Or is she, should we honor her as a hard worker? Even the lowly clerk, supposedly lowly clerk, who chooses to take hours 40 to 50 in her work week to make sure that everybody gets paid properly. She's an accounts payable clerk, paid properly and on time. Should we criticize her and call her names like, alcohol, like workaholic? or even if her goal is not to be altruistic, even just to make some more money for her family. Should we not honor these people rather than denigrate them with a term that's really as d diminishing as, as, as workaholic? Next. Um, degrees. If you think anybody would be in favor of degrees, it would be me. I mean, my parents said education, education, education. I have a PhD from Berkeley. You know, who would be a bigger fan of education? I'm not going to go into details. I'm just going to say that it is not as black and white there is incredible amounts of data, and it is actually the longest part of my presentation there, with data after data after data that we need a much more nuanced approach before you decide to go back to school for a certificate, let alone a degree, luck. We all tend to say, especially who are high achievers, we make our own luck. We, you know, luck, you know, good luck comes to people who work hard. But the reality is, that sometimes luck is more important than I used to think. I used to believe that if I was smart enough and worked hard enough, everything's going to work out. You know what? As a career counselor, I've seen a million people who have not worked hard, who were lucky to be born beautiful, or smart, or driven, and healthy, the, made the right people, who end up being quite successful, financially at least, without working hard at all. And on the other side, like this wonderful woman who was the environmentalist who killed herself to try to make a living as an environmentalist, and she's in welfare housing with high blood pressure and 60 on one, one step from being homeless. So sometimes hard work pays and sometimes it doesn't. So my message again is about nuance. Not, you know, that you shouldn't work hard, but that it ain't no guarantee and more important, when you and I, and I'm guilty of this, I'm not going to tell you I'm great about this, 
When you see somebody who has been utterly unsuccessful, rather than writing them off as lazy or whatever, there's a lot of luck, much more luck in this world. We, you know, our intelligence is part environment and part genetic. If someone was born unlucky to not have that good genes and born into a family who where the parents were good, weren't good parents and the neighborhood stunk and the school stunk and they didn't meet the right people that got in with the wrong crowd, there's a lot of luck that went into their being unsuccessful. I invite you to at least consider replacing some of that judgment with a greater amount of charity. I don't necessarily mean financially charity as much as a charitable attitude. And that is, so that is the eighth, that you make your own luck is the eighth, the, the eighth of the uh, career truths that may not be so true. Uh, I want to end with a story, but before that we have a few minutes for questions. Because we only have a few minutes, I'm going to ask you to be quite judicious. Ask questions only if you feel that it's not just your individual problem. I was happy to answer your individual question before and yours, but now I'd like you to ask a question only if you think it would benefit not only this live audience, but the people who will be uh, watching this on video. Anybody got a question that you think would be useful for all of us to hear? Please. Um, several, years ago, several years ago, I transitioned out of corporate. I wanted to be self-employed. At the time, I thought I was going to build a business, but after a lot of uh, self-searching, I decided to remain an independent consultant. I've loved what I've done. I've had great clients and great projects. And now I would really like to transition back into a corporate environment. And I've had a variety of um, career mentors, et cetera, tell me that it's going to be nearly impossible because I've been self-employed for 18 years and they're going to, they being the corporations, the hiring um, individuals, that I'll be too independent and that I won't you know, play the corporate line. And so trying to remarket myself back into that environment has proven really challenging. Fabulous yeah. question. That's a perfect question. Uh, it is difficult, but not impossible. Remember I used the term radical honesty before? Uh, there's two things I'm going to want you to remember. The term radical honesty and that you are not going to apply for jobs through the front door. You are not going to answer ads. If an employer, remember I mentioned it before, if an employer wanted to hire somebody who doesn't have the exact experience, they wouldn't place an ad. They wouldn't bother going through the hundreds of resumes that come in. You are going to get in the, the back door. You are going to identify 20 people who love you. It's an odd term. Whether or not you, they have a job potential for you or not. And you're going to identify 20 organizations that you'd like to work for. And they're not going to be the designer. They're not going to be Google. They're not going to be Apple. They're not going to be HP. Because they have so many applicants, forget that but 20 perhaps smaller organizations where you'd like to work and 20 people who love you and you're going to use radical honesty. You're going to tell your true human story so that they can understand instead of responding with, this, with the standard pat answer, oh, you're probably going to be too independent, they're going to feel you the human being and see that this is the logical next step in your life. And Many of them will blow you off, but you only need one. But I think that is the way you maximize your chances of getting hired. Okay? Let's take one more question, and then I, want, then I have to end with the story. And I will stay afterwards, by the way. I do have a little more time, uh, and I will answer any other questions you have afterwards. So if you want to stay, you can. But let's take one more question that we will record. One question you think that everybody needs, that, that her question was terrific. Another question that lots of people would benefit from hearing an answer to. Okay. You're being so judicious. What do you wish we asked that was missing? Thank you. What, uh, she asked, what question did she wish I would ask? What's the meaning of life? Um, no. That's too self-centered. Well, if once she's, for the microphone, for, she said, I asked, what's the meaning of life? She said to evolve. Not true at all. I could grow and evolve and whatever, and that will make some difference in the world, but it won't make that much. I could evolve and be a better yoga, do yoga better. I could play a better basketball player. I could evolve to, to be, read more, more literature instead of, you know, Pulp Fiction. Um, one guy's opinion. And again, I am not the, the font of all wisdom. 
But I do think it's a useful metaphor that has changed my life completely and many of my clients. I believe that every moment that we live on this earth could be scored on a scale from minus 10 to plus 10. If I'm selling crack to children, it's a minus 10. It's about as bad as it gets. If I'm working to cure cancer, it's a plus 10. Every moment of my life, every minute, could be scored on that meter. Now, I'm not saying there isn't room in life for fun. I love playing with my doggy Einstein. I love being with my wife. I love hiking every day, which I do. But I would make those choices consciously. I'm aware that every minute of my life could be scored somewhere on that meter. Why am I here? Why is, this, why is my, why am I so into, this feels like it scores really high on the meter. I feel like this makes a difference. I may be deluding myself. But I invite you to take, to think about your life, about every minute, every hour, every whatever, and ask yourself, where would this activity score on the meter? And then consciously decide, is this time for recreation? Should I watch a sitcom? Should I volunteer? Should I look for a job? Thinking about the meaning of life, the life well led, in terms of the meter, I think is a useful question. I wish you, and I loved your question. That's the question I wish you would have asked. What is my definition, at least, of the life well led? Now, I want to end with a story. The year was 1939. The town was Sierpz, Poland. My father was a teenager living with his parents. Indoors, were, it was very halcyon, very peaceful. And one day, there was a knock on the door. And it was two Nazis in black boots. And unlike in the movies, they didn't yell. One was silent, and the other whispered. You will be out of your house with only what you can carry on your back by noon tomorrow or else. And by noon the next day, there were no longer two Nazis. There were 12. And there were two trucks. But they were no longer whispering. Yes! They went into all the Jewish households, and they grabbed everybody out, and they put the young and the old in one truck and the able-bodied in another. And my father never saw his parents again. And he and 11 men escaped from a work camp because he had the good luck. I, won't, I, can't, I don't have time to go into the details. He escaped. Lived in the Black Forest thanks to the good Christians who took care of him. At the end of the war, he was dropped on a cargo boat and dumped in the Bronx, New York. Without a penny to his name, no money, no English, no education, nothing but the scars of the Holocaust tortures. What did he do? He took whatever job he could get, and it was sewing shirts on the, uh, for a factory in Harlem. And at night, what did he do? He knew he didn't want to be making minimum wage for the rest of his life, and he knew if he didn't speak English, that's what he would be doing. So he went to Roosevelt High School night school to learn English. And what did he do on Saturdays? Did he watch Saturday morning football? No, he took those shirts that he had sewed during the week and sold them out of a cardboard box in the street. What did he do with his money? He didn't spend it. He saved up enough for the first and last month's rent on a crappy little store, 105 Moore Street. You can Google Maps it now. 105 Moore Street is still a horrible neighborhood. 105 Moore Street in Brooklyn, so that he could move my mom and my sister and me from the tenement that I lived in the Bronx on Westchester Avenue, right underneath the elevated train roaring 24-7 where we couldn't sleep, to the bottom half of a duplex in Queens. But as I said, the neighborhood was terrible. And on the weekends, it was a store was so small that they, he had to put most of the merchandise on folding tables. And on the weekends, when school was out, the kids would come and they would just steal boxes of shirts, boxes of sunglasses. And so when I was old enough, he couldn't afford to hire a security guard. So when I was old enough, 13, I would come and I would be the security guard. If you think I'm nerdy now, you should have seen me then. <laughs> <laughs> and the most vivid memory of my life was one day when business was slow. And I remember leaning on a parking meter, and I was on this side of the parking meter, and my dad was on this side. 
And I suddenly had this question pop into my brain. I don't know why. I said, Daddy, how come you so rarely talk about the Holocaust? And he stiffened, which he rarely did. And he looked me in the eye and he says, Martin, the Nazis took five years from my life. I won't let them have one minute more. He said, Martin, never look back. Always take the next step forward. I can leave you with no better advice. I talked about scoring every moment that you live uh, in terms of where it would be on the meter from minus 10 selling crack to plus 10 curing cancer. And he says, there may be a more holistic way to look at it. As you lie on your deathbed, how will you feel about the way in which you navigated the unfathomables of life? Because not all is crystalline, far from it. And I thank you very much for your excellent comment. I'm well, happy to keep, you know, if people have more questions, I am here for you. And you also, if you need to leave, you may leave. Of course, you, I understand many of you are on your lunch hour and you have to go back to work. I am not offended at all. Please leave. <laughs> But feel free to please take, I'm really, please take the handout of, of this, this transcript of the speech that I had prepared, and I will be out there to sign a couple of my, I have a couple of books, How to Do Life, What They Didn't Teach You in School, and What's the Big Idea, 39 Reinventions for a Better America. I'll be out there in a few minutes. But first, my priority is you. Questions. Do you have any other questions, or should I go out there? You, please, go ahead. Um, I was curious when you were talking about uh, her question, um, about how you use I didn't quite get how you use the 20 people who love you. Thank you. And so Thank you for asking. It's a very wonderful follow-up question. I say what you want to do is tell your true human story, what I call with radical honesty. When I was a little girl, I thought I wanted to be this. I ended up doing that. I made this big mistake, but this worked out well. Then I decided I was going to be self-employed. I thought it was going to work, but it didn't work. For this. You know, walking through the story, the, the, the success. I don't want you to say you're a basket case, but your true story. And not at great length, but briefly, reduce it to two minutes or whatever, so that we feel we're talking to a human. So many job seekers check their humanity at the door, and instead they, they use job seeker language. I'm a dynamic self-starter who delights in exceeding customer expectations <laughs> and is seeking opportunity with a high-velocity organization. <laughs> yeah. You know, no employer will ever resonate with that. What is missing in this ever more frantic society we live in is humanity and integrity. So much BS. Every politician on both sides of the aisle is BSing their way through every press conference and through every speech. And what we all quietly hunger for is integrity in our personal relationships as well as in our professional. And so if you speak your truth with radical honesty to employers, the wrong employers, will, will, there's the fools of that, that group of employers will say, oh, no, I want to hear you know, somebody who can play the game. Yes, dynamic self-starter, blah, blah. The right employer, the employer you want to work for, will resonate with your radical honesty. One more question, and then I will. Yes, please. Um, so when you were talking about you know, how networking doesn't work for some people, right. for most Uh, I don't usually let them go at all. We look at their track record. We look at what, the, what their past has been like, and we make a judgment. Every client, if I'm, if I'm trying to help them get a job, we make a pie chart that's individualized to them. There are basically four ways to land a job. And the ratio and, and the amount of time you spend on each one will vary with the person. One is networking. That is with people you already know or building a new connect, set of connections. Two is cold contact with target employers that you want to hire. That's not networking. That's directly trying to get hired. Three is answering ads. And four is headhunters, recruiters. And the, depending upon the person, the ratio will change. For some people, networking will be 80% of it. For others, it'll be 0%. So it really varies with the person. I don't let them. We start out with, you know, after we've identified a really clear career goal, we then develop an action plan that's individualized to help that person land the position or self-employment that he wants that is completely individualized, and the pie chart becomes the the basis on uh, from which how they're going to allocate their 20 or 30 hours a week in looking for a job. 
All right. I thank you again all. I'll be out there happy to answer any more of your questions. And I'll be signing up. <laughs>